Our next speaker is uh, David Blackmore, um, uh, another person who has definitely had uh, skin in the game, as you say, with um, right to farm issues. David Blackmore is a fifth generation farmer who has studied uh, Japanese genetics and methodology when breeding, raising, and farming wagyu animals. Uh, David's going to talk about uh, his um, experience uh, in uh, opposition to his wagyu farm in Victoria. Thank you, David. The pure, true, true presentation. Um, thank you for the uh, invitation to address this important conference. And can I assure you I'm not a person who's a political activist or motivated to put myself forward to campaign on any issue. It's for those reasons that um, I first declined this invitation and to meet with his persuasive commentary convinced me that the farmer's right to farm is one of the most important issues facing uh, farmer's sustainability and whether I like it or not I've become one of the faces of this issue. Um, I can absolutely assure you that I'm much more comfortable at home in the paddock than I am here. When thinking about how to put this, to, this uh, address together, it fell into two categories. One of what I wanted to say, and the second, the industri industry concerns that must be said. It would be much more col colourful if I said what I wanted to say, but I decided to stick with the second category and, talk category and talk about the issues all farmers have to address, using the issues that we have faced as examples of long, arduous, frustrating, stressful and nonsensical process we as business and family have endured over the last three years and we lost and have shut down our feeding farm. You'll find our story goes in a full cycle circle. Last month on the 12th of October the Victorian Government released its response to the Australian Industries Advisory Committee which was set up after our story was national and international news. In a few words it can be summarised by saying that the legislation will be designed to meet community expectations. Keep that phrase in mind as I proceed with our experience. We're a family business with no outside investors. We farm 8,000 acres and run nearly 4,000 cattle. I'm a fifth generation farmer and I might add that the uh, little guy on the left of the picture is my father who's now 91 years old. Um, our business was incorporated in 1982, but in reality took its current direction after I discovered Wagyu in the US in 1988. We've worked hard and with some innovative and business change, changing decisions have created a product and brand that is rec recognised and exported globally. It is sought after by some of the world's most, as world's best and most high profile chefs in over 20 countries. We've had over 20 international and domestic documentaries filmed on our farm. Tourism Victoria and Tourism Australia use our story to encourage visitors to, uh, tourists to visit Australia. We, we have received uh, more than 25 awards over 15 years in recognition of our achievements in areas as diverse as product excellence, business success, um, livestock production, our contribution to the Australian food industry and sustainable farming methods which include protecting the environment, animal welfare and profitability. And I guess um, most farmers here would understand sustainability but also understand that if you're not profitable, you're not sustainable. Australia no Mr. Wagyu, David Blackmore. 日本の和牛の遺伝子を受け継ぐオーストラリア産の和牛を作り出し世界に広めた男の挑戦は続いている ブラックモアは和牛のビジネスを始めた頃から餌の配合にこだわってきた何度も日本に視察に行き改良を重ねてきた日本で理想的な育て方を学んできたけれどそのまま取り入れてもオーストラリアではうまくいかないんだよ
だからオーストラリアの環境に合うように工夫してきたんだ完璧な餌の配合を探り当てるまでに12年以上かかったよブラックモアは4年前自ら開発してきた和牛の生産ノウハウを提供するビジネスを始めた飼育の方法から農場の運営まで培ってきた技術が流出することに恐れはない受精卵が肉になるまで最低5年はかかる私の飼育のノウハウを自分のものにするのにも最低56年はかかるでしょうその頃には私はもっと先に行っているだろう農業はハートではなく頭を使ってやらなければならない私の祖父や父の代がやってきたやり方はもう通用しないんだ時代は進み続けている膨張を続ける和牛ビジネス Eco feeding farm and to remove all our cattle from the feedlot. Animal welfare groups were starting to refer feedlots, especially from the US,、um, as factory farming. We divided our farm into 65 two hectare paddocks, set up a lane way system to assess them individually, and put water and feed troughs on solid pads、um, to feed a specially designed supplementary eco ration to each paddock. We designed the farm in a way. Um, that, that we have 70% of our manure recycled as a natural fertiliser on our irrigation paddocks. We set up our own feeding process area and become fully self reliant. Then a neighbour complained that we'd set up a feedlot which was affecting their lifestyle. They were a retired couple who had moved to the country and were annoyed by our tractors, our utes, our motorbikes, and the cattle noise and odour that are part of everyday farming. This neighbour had purchased a house on a three hectare block in an area zone rural farming、um, by the Shire. On no occasion prior to the purchase did the neighbour approach us to inquire about our farming methodology or plans for the future. The complaints to the local Murrumbidgee Shire led to the Shire asking us for a report of our farming activities. We gave them two reports, which in hindsight was a mistake. They asked us to apply for an extensive farming permit, which we applied for. Two weeks later, they advised us that extensive farming did not require a permit, and they were going to assess the permit as intensive farming, which did require a permit. We resub resubmitted another report, adding the fact that seven, that seven state and industry regulatory bodies had no objection to us、uh, using our now current farming methods on our farm. The Shire's agriculture expert and own planning department both recommended the councillors to grant a permit. The councillors voted against the permit, not on the grounds that our farming methods contravened any regulations, but on the grounds that we contravened community expectations and we affected the amenity and the lifestyle of our neighbours. I add that a retired couple had the support of a local farmer who lived 15 kilometres away. Stephen Hanbury, a nephew of Rupert Murdoch, and the owner of the Anvil Angus Stud, is the source of the legal advice behind, firstly, the objections to our permit with the Shire, and secondly, secondly to the objections to the farmers' right to farm hearing at the Animal Industries Advisory Committee was set up by the state government. His commentary and submissions to both hearings are found online. I've had many farmers comment to me that this is the most puzzling. Public, Puzzling situation in the process. As one farmer, farmer commented to me, farmers help one another, not run one, not run one another out of business. Immediately after the permit application was corrected,、um, object, uh, rejected, the media storm hit. I did not instigate one story. 
In most cases, the media approached me for our story. In some cases, media stories appeared without my knowledge. The most spe spectacular story was when the celebrity and renowned Rockwell chef Neil Perry set up an online petition calling on the state government to reverse the decision made by our local government. Close to 130,000 people signed the petition both nationally and internationally. The petition had been set up so the Victorian Premier, the Planning Minister and the Agriculture Minister all received an email from all the 130,000 petitioners. I guess it got their attention. Even Barnaby had his say. We let the controversy play out in the media and prior to the deadline to lodge a legal objection, we did so. In less than 24 hours, the Planning Minister called it in, taking the, taking the case out of the courts and making it his decision about our right to farm. The Minister set up two committees to look at the two issues. Firstly, our right to farm, and secondly, the current Victorian regulations that are up to 40 years old, and to see if they needed updating and what the update should look like. The advisory committee to look at the Blackmore case had a directions hearing on the 28th of October last year. At this hearing, the objectors' lawyers, led by Mr Hanbury, asked for and obtained the right for export experts appointed by them to come in onto our farm to go through our farming and business methodology and then present these findings to the public hearing. Our objection was turned down. On the 5th of November, we advised the Minister we were withdrawing our application for intensive farming permit. It was reported in the media that withdrawal was due to the ongoing family stress that we were under, which was enormous, and I sympathise you, absolutely. In reality, we had come to the realisation that this fight could go on for years and we were over it and our business would stagnate during that time. We wanted to move on with expansion plans led by our children who are taking a more active role in the company's future direction and management. However, the main reason for withdrawing has never been reported. It was due to our, to our intellectual property, method of production and self-funded genomics research a project that has a really valuable commercial value. We have sold a license for our IP and MOP to a client in the US for half a million dollars. We're close to signing other licenses in other countries for more money, as will include the data from our genomics research. We could not allow the experts to come onto our property and report on our method of production and IP, and then they report their findings to the public hearing. It would make our IP and, F and method of production valueless as an income source for our business. We find it interesting that Mr. Hamry has a cousin with a significant wagyu operation, farm and business. I hope they up here. <laughs> In February, the Victorian Government's Annual Industries Advisory Committee held a week of submissions. 146 submissions were received at public hearings in four locations. Some submitters were asked to keep their submissions brief, but most were 10 to 30 minutes. Mr. Hanbury's lawyers asked for three hours to present their submissions. They asked for a copy of my submissions prior to the hearing. Both their requests were granted. I don't know if I feel, should feel victimised here. We had withdrawn our application for an intensive um, farming permit on the 5th of November, more than three months prior to this hearing. The government received the, the report in April and finally released their response on the 12th of October last month. In summary, the government's response of the 27th, in summary, the government's response was that the 37 re recommendations, they supported 19, supported in principle 12, further investigation required was five and did not support one. The recommendations left a lot of current regulations in place, toughened up some in the support of community expectations and change some that do not support the farmer's right to farm. One troubling change is that the old regulation stated you need an intensive farming permit if you imported the majority of food onto the premises. The recommendation is now that if you import the majority of the nutrients onto the farm, you need an intensive farming permit. Farmers are aware that there may be plenty of feed on their property at certain times of the year, but it's got very poor nutritional value. It is common practice to import liquid supplements, and, and, and grain to add nutritional value to the health and the well-being of the livestock. These farmers will need to apply an intensive farming permit. 
It appears if you've got six chooks in your backyards and you import layers pellets, you'll need a permit. Now to complete and join the circle. We have closed down our feeding farm and are keen to buy and set up again. We are twice shy after having wasted $2 million um, setting up our current farm. We have had 12 shires in four states offering us assistance to move our business into their shire. Our first priority is to find the right farm that meets our objectives. We would hope the government's response called the Planning um, for Sustainable Animal, animal Industries would give us some clarification. In fact, it has made the future more confusing. They have shirked the issues of the farmer's right to farm in, in favour of meeting community expectations. They have given more power to the shire, shires, asking them to decide. We are worse off. Even if, as we did in our previous attempt to set up a profitable business, getting the go-ahead from all the regulatory bodies and the shires own planning department, a group, a group of self uh, self-interested councillors voted against the permit. What if the current councillors have voted to grant us a permit on our new farm and then the next group of councillors can then ask you to apply for a brand, a brand new permit based around community expectations and amenity issues and you could lose that permit. We would never set up again without owning our own buffer zones. <coughs> community expectations are changing all the time. The environment and animal welfare issues uh, are always front and centre. In our case, we changed our method of production and we were globally applauded. It just so happened that we moved our feeding program to our home farm and onto land zone rural farming that lifestyle, lifestyle is said not on our patch and claimed amenity issues and the local council judged we did not meet community expectations. If Australian farmers don't have the right to farm in a sustainable manner, food will need to be imported from countries that have very lax animal welfare and environmental regulations and control. Then we got David Blackmore, the Wagyu beef dude. Now, you know, problem or boon to mankind? I don't really know. <laughs> This is David Blackmore. David decided he wanted to be the only guy in Australia raising 100% full-blooded Japanese Wagyu beef. Come on, girls. Come on. What is Wagyu beef? Basically, it's the most luxuriously fatty, highly marbled, carefully raised, and damned expensive beef on Earth. One sirloin strip wholesale in New York can cost well over $1,000 before trimming off waist and bone. Come on. You might have heard the stuff referred to as Kobe beef. Kobe is a place. Wagyu is what they raise there. It's my life and it's my passion. And it's where I'm really, really comfortable is out working with the cattle in the paddock. I'm actually a fifth generation farmer. We've been marketing embryos and semen now to quite a few different countries. Yep, he's also in the sperm business. I guess I can pretty much insert joke here, right? <laughs> Every animal has been DNA'd for parent verification. They've all got their own ear tag and they've all got their own number and their mother and their father in small writing is written at the top of the ear tag. To learn how to breed our animals, we had to learn what was successful and how they bred them in Japan. David's obsession with Wagyu began in 1998 when he discovered his first breed. This is an original Japanese pedigree. Those prints have been used in Japan um, to identify the animals and so they can't be confused and that nobody can be cheating. As you can see, the nose prints are really, really different from one to another. It's like human fingerprints. There's no two the same. These are family trees and these probably go back um, 10 and 12 generations. Originating entirely in Japan, each animal's bloodline is a matter of record. You know every stake's mommy and daddy and grandparents all the way back. This particular bull called Yosemi Doi is a bull very, very famous for producing meat quality. So we've got a combination here of volume and quality. Now David's crossbreeding between Wagyu bloodlines, looking for an even more flavorful steak. The obsession part, <laughs> I guess I'm just born that way. David breeds the beast. He leaves the cooking to the professionals. This is Paul Wilson. The time of this shooting, head chef at the famous Melbourne restaurant, Botanical. We should try some, eh? Terrific Australian olive oil, salt, a bit of a nice crust, some pepper. Beautiful. 
And really, you don't have to do too much to it. Just, so that's the beautiful colour you want, that lovely crust and caramelisation of the fat. I'll just show you that, so that consistency in the marbling right through. Just some delicious caramelised shallots. The flavour and tenderness is unlike anything you've ever had. <laughs> I'm not even chewing it and it's almost dissolving on my tongue. You can't compare it with normal beef. It's got its own flavours, it's got its own textures. I just like the fact that people like the end result and it's, you know, it's my passion to get it to that stage. You know, it's a whole team and then, you know, in comes the butcher and in comes the chef at the end of the day as well, so. See, this is an obsession I can relate to, or I'm happy to benefit from anyway. Continue, please, David Blackmore, breeding your pampered fatty beef. There's nothing like it. The world is a better place for it.